okay, so uh, today is the 1st of June. I think at one time maybe still is uh, the, the Children's Day or the, the Day of the Child, something like this. I don't know if Sir Norman Foster, especially since he became a Sir, uh, and uh, Toyo Ito and uh, Rafael Vignoli are still, I think they do. I think they still have the, that irresponsibility of the child in them. Uh, they didn't grow up. Uh, in the United States, there is this saying, I'm too old to grow up. So I imagine uh, the restlessness of uh, Norman Foster to begin with, who is 87 years old today, and uh, more moderate restlessness of Toyo Ito, who is 81 or 82, and the uh, restlessness of Rafael Vignoli might be explained in this way, uh, that they are too old to grow up. This, by the way, of the fact that uh, indeed uh, architects do contribute to the, uh, to the some of the problems that exist in the world. So Norman Foster, Baron Foster, the, the Baron Foster of Thames Bank. I mean, wow, you know, we are talking about a man who made it. And he was born in, in uh, very modest circumstances. And we have to appreciate him for this, actually. You know, he made it up there in the stratosphere of human society uh, because of uh, his work and, and talent and dedication and, uh, you know, maybe some uh, happy circumstances as well. This is the man. We all know him. I, I was always intrigued about how he dresses. I mean, you know, this we are talking about a British man, right? Well, British men are supposed to behave, uh, but uh, he's uh, unconventional sometimes in the way he dresses. It could be very, very, very elegant, but uh, even here, you know, the tie is uh, problematically, uh, you know, connected, so to speak, with that shirt. There is no problem with this. Um, anyway, an interesting man, actually, and he loves to bike. Uh, here he is with his uh, with wife, uh, a, a Spanish, a Spanish lady. He has an office in Madrid as well, uh, but uh, I imagine he has uh, offices in many cities. And um, I actually have a friend, a Romanian architect, who worked for him in Madrid. Uh, Stefan Christian Popa, and then he uh, studied for his doctorate at the Architectural Association in London. I regret I didn't find him, I didn't invite him today here. Hello, Mr. Foster, happy birthday to you, 87 years old. Not bad, and still kicking. Um, an ambitious man, no doubt. Uh, very ambitious. Now, of course, he's on the left, not on the right. No, he's not on the left. On the left is actually the, the, the mayor of London. Foster uh, is in good company here near the governor or the, or the mayor of New York City, Mr. Bloomberg and so on. He is receiving some kind of a prize, I think from the, the prince or the king or whatever he is of Spain. Uh, this man got all the prizes, I mean, some people just make it in this world, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, uh, at the end will be always the same for all of us. But for someone like him, I, I think it's even more regretful um, that day when, when that happens. And I hope in his case will never come, but until now, this never happened on this earth. So with a vast and fair amount of awards received, Sir Norman Foster, is one of the best for portfolios of architecture in the world. His works are functional, well-established, and with a unique beauty, taking advantage of the brilliant and detailed structures used, reach a final result perfectly balanced. So we are talking here about uh, an almost uh, unhuman uh, accomplishment. Born on the 1st of June, 1935, in the town of Reddish, England, talking about the red architecture. At 16, he left school, I like this, and went to work at Manchester City Treasurer's Office before joining national service in the Royal Air Force. In 1956, 
He entered the Manchester University School of Architecture uh, and City Planning, graduating in 1961. He won the, the Henry Fellowship at Yale School of Architecture in the United States, where he met Rich, Richard Rogers, who also became a sir later, who would eventually become his business partner and where he also got his master's degree. So he graduated uh, both from uh, Manche Manchester and uh, uh, in the United States from Yale University. After that, he traveled for a year around the United States before returning to the United Kingdom in 1963. Uh, and he was very influenced at the beginning by, uh, by, by the United States. So I, I, I'm beginning with his, uh, some of his earliest works. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, here we have uh, these four architects, actually, <laughs> you know, uh, so we know Norman Foster and we know Richard Rogers. Uh, they both studied at Yale and they became friends, I guess. And then they opened an office with their wives, uh, Sue Bramwell and Wendy Chisman. Here it is a picture with them. Uh, <laughs> What is funny here is that the wife of the future wife of uh, uh, Sir Norman Foster, who is here, actually si sits on the on the knees of uh, Richard Rogers, and the future wife of uh, Richard Rogers sits on the knees of uh, Sir Norman Foster. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's just uh, you know uh, an accidental happening, but they look happy and nice and. Uh, uh, you know, young, uh, energetic uh, British uh, people uh, enjoying uh, the, the miraculous 60s when there was uh, an energy in the air, when, when people still believed in idealism, in flowers, in making love and not words, and so on. And I think we need that spirit again somehow. Reliance controls these old traditional boundaries. This is a building they built then. It's about the diagonals, it's about the cross bracing he added, it's about showing what is holding the building up, pushed to a metallic extreme. I like it, you know, it's uh, uh, pre high tech, it's, it's, it's technological, but indeed it's fresh, it's honest, uh, it has an optimism which uh, these days we kind of miss. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a factory, it's a production uh, space. Uh, but uh, how else could it be? We certainly wouldn't build a, a Versailles for this kind of activity. Uh, so uh, this is an early work built by uh, this uh, group of four people and they had some you know, uh, help from a few other people. I think actually the initial, the first building built was for the father of one of those two ladies. I, I forgot. Uh, one. Maybe uh, the future wife of uh, Sir Richard Rogers. The Renault Distribution Center from 1982. I love this one too. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a techno man at all, but I admire this architecture. You know, it's, it's, it's even colorful. You know, who would use yellow in this way today? Not too many people. And the, and the purity of the structure, the acrobatics of the metallic structure as well, uh, makes it, uh, I would say, still a remarkable building. Uh, it's here probably no, but uh, but Sir Norman Foster also was uh, was uh, was and is interested in technology. But here maybe we see a little bit more of the aesthetics of Sir Richard Rogers, his friend. Um, anyway, um, again another building which is. Uh, you know, celebrating, uh, you know, technology, and human work and all the rest. Unfortunately, it also celebrates cars and uh, Sir uh, Norman Foster, Baron of the Thames, he's uh, a great lover of cars and he has a collection, I think, of cars and so on. Stockley Park offices. Uh, they built anything there because, again, that's why architects are on earth to build. And at the beginning, uh, you know, they received all kinds of commissions, but I think they carried them on uh, properly. Uh, that's what is this text. He had always been a model. I'm talking about uh, Sir Richard Rogers. We had, uh, he had always been a model student. 
and his skills showed a remarkable flair for architecture. But he still always came under the influence of architects Frank Lloyd Wright, Miss Van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier. After his return from America, North America, that is uh, actually from the United States, because when you say North America, there we have Canada too. But for some strange reason, when, when we say America, we, we only think of the United States when there are so many countries in Americas with an S at the end. Norman Foster started the partnership with Richard Rogers and the sisters. Ah, they, they were actually sisters, the two ladies, Georgie and Wendy Chisman, called Team Four. They quickly gained a reputation for industrial design high tech. In 1967, he formed with Andy the office Foster's Associates, which quickly transformed into Foster's and Partners. A year later, he began a long partnership with the American architect Richard uh, Buckminster Fuller, which only added, ended with the death of Fuller in 1983. This is interesting. Maybe one day uh, we'll be interested in a, in a presentation about Fuller and Foster. Saints were a center for visual arts in, in, in Norwich. I go quickly because, again, we have a large body of work to show uh, Toyo Ito and Rafael Vignoli. Um, but I hope this quick uh, Ed Memoir will, will crystallize some uh, knowledge about these uh, three important contemporary architects. Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank headquarters in Hong Kong, 1985, a seminal work, an ambitious work, as banks are able to pay for. Of course, it's this building here. And um, today I read that uh, Rem Kolhas on Arch Daily is uh, talking about the new urbanism uh, possible in the Arab world. I, I think this Rem Kolhas is a hypocrite because just a few years ago, he was celebrating the village and rurality. And he had a big show at the Guggenheim Museum in New York exactly about this. He even planted a tractor in front of the Guggenheim just to show the, you know, the appeal of the rural. And now he's talking about, anyway, I guess you have to be opportunistic uh, and even a hypocrite in order to receive commissions. Uh, the building by Foster is not bad. Again, it's, it's, it's celebrating human power. It's celebrating uh, the ability to do anything is uh, actually in, in, in metal, in steel. And there is glass, of course, he would say that this is a very sustainable building, which is not, and none of his buildings actually is, whatever he might say, windows do not open in the, in the buildings by, uh, by uh, Sir Norman Foster, none, and there is a need for an immense amount of, you know, uh, conditioned air in his buildings, and that conditioned air is, is uh, as we know, uh, a major source of uh, pollution and uh, you know unnecessary expenditures and so on. But this man believes in the powers of man, uh, and uh, he does. He's not a Hamletian figure. He doesn't have doubts too many, uh, I think. Anyway, I mean, just look at these pieces of, of of steel. You know, this is heavy steel. You know, this is not uh, just a carcass. This is just a small fragment of the structural part of this building. I mean, look, look what's going on here. And this is just one city in one country, but just imagine at the scale of the earth. Yes, probably God himself and the gods on Mount Olympus uh, are amazed of what uh, you know, the creature, the created uh, Adam uh, was able to, to, to do, but, but my mission is to create a structure that is sensitive to the culture and climate of its place. Yeah, sure. I hope I have here a project he did for Africa, which is totally insensitive to the culture and climate of its place. I hope I have it. Uh, Willie, Willis Faber and Dumas, another headquarters, another building with a lot of glass. He is a skillful architect, of course. He had a lot of success. Look at all those... Um, humans on the on the terrace of the building you know uh, you could not have told those people you know to that uh, 
one day, not much later, we'll, uh, we'll be, we would be confronted with the melting of the icebergs and the rising levels of the seas. Uh, you know, look, there are plants here, there are huge spaces, no window opens, there is no fresh air coming from the outside, so the fresh air has to come from the inside, artificially produced in the mega machines built by um, Sir Norman Foster and others, of course, many others. Anyway, at least he builds well. Foster's career uh, already has more than 470 awards. I don't know if I can continue. I am breathless. 470 awards. And he's still going. <laughs> what does he do with those awards, <laughs> really? But then Henry Gibson also loved uh, awards and medals and very strange. Uh, anyway, uh, Louis, uh, Leonardo da Vinci would have considered them the tongues of fame. But um, who knows, maybe Leonardo was himself, uh, you know, growing old and rather bitter. Leonardo, did, I don't think he ever received any award. Foster received 470 awards. By the time when I made this presentation, by now he probably has at least 500. And citations for excellence and has won over 86 national and international competitions. This man wins everything. In 1990, he was awarded the Queen's Birthday Honors. In 1997, by the, the, that honor, he became known as Lord Foster of Thames Bank. Stansted Air Airport. Uh, yeah. Well, when they built this airport, they didn't imagine that some years later uh, there will be COVID in the world and the, and the airports will be empty at least for a while, but we are going back to the airports. Uh, we forgot the pandemic and uh, we took off the masks and we continue to fly and fly and fly, meaning to run away, run away, run away from whom? From ourselves. Uh, because it's much easier to take the plane and go to Dubai than to sit under a tree like a yogi and reflect on who am I? Where do I come from? Where do I go to use the, the approximate words of uh, Paul Gauguin? Airports, 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 and, and, and capitalism thrives like this, you know. It's production, consumption, flying, running on the highway, consuming gasoline. Let's do it, you know, let's do it. Let's start wars in Iraq, in Ukraine. Let's, let's milk the the earth of all its resources as if they are infinite and they are not infinite. I was contemplating today a little bug on the floor. It doesn't need a battery to move. Nothing made by the human being can move without a battery or without some kind of artificial electricity, energy, nothing, nothing. So that little black dot we call an insect has a life within that even the most sophisticated human machine doesn't have. We cannot create things that, 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 that are able to move without uh, artificial energy. And this should uh, humble us a little bit, I would say. Yes, I'm talking about the smallest, most insignificant and anonymous insect. And you know, these insects are not stupid. You know, I wanted to, with regrets, with regrets, it's true, I wanted to kill it. But when I approached my uh, foot, uh, the sole of my foot, it ran away. And I don't even think it, it, it saw my foot coming. It felt. They are not stupid. The most, you know, I mean, certainly there is no room for a brain there. But what made that little dot on the floor run away? Anyway. Back to Foster, uh, Baron of the Thames Bank, God, you know, it's intimidating, really. Riverside Apartments in London. I think his office is here, one of his offices, yes, on the first floors. I said floors with a plural, a big office. You are not going to see one single T-square and rectangle there. I have seen pictures with it, none. 
None, of course, because they don't work with these squares and rectangles for, uh, I almost exaggerated, for half a century, well, for only 30 years or for 30 something. Everyone in the studio, whatever their job description, has a place at one of the long workbenches. The arrangement is very fluid with no division between design and production. Open 24 hours a day, can you imagine? Seven days a week, can we imagine? The building is animated by its young and cosmopolitan staff. The average age is about 30 and as many languages are spoken. This is very nice. Most offices keep visitors at arm's length. The Foster studio by contrast is completely open. Visitors can enjoy the bar, the social focus of the, the office, while meetings, whether formal or informal, occur in the midst of the creative process itself. Well, it sounds beautiful, but I don't know if how true this is because I saw once, uh, one year or two years ago, here on Zoom, um, Victor Moldovanuk, uh, who works for Foster and Associates, and he was a student at Minku for uh, five years, and he looked uh, consumed, if not, uh, I mean, I think I think they work very hard. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they have too much time for enjoying the bar and all the rest. No, no, I, th I think Sir Norman Foster uh, is, uh, is demanding. And uh, how else could he build the, the whole world without being demanding? Two crucial characteristics of the studio, his studio and the way they, we work, he said, uh, are the democracy and freedom of communication that we enjoy. I, again, I have some doubts. I don't think he's the most democratic architect in the world. But I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but I don't think the atmosphere in his office is similar to the atmosphere in uh, some Scandinavian, even large office. Anyway, I, again, I, I, I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. The studio has no partitions or separate rooms. Well, after the pandemic, they might consider some changes and meetings tend to take place informally in the midst of a creative process, often focused on a model or around the computer screen. Strange, they don't mention the T-square and the rectangle and the drafting board. And here it is. Now let's contemplate for a short while this office. And let's ask ourselves, why do we continue to work with the T-square and the rectangle? Because no serious architecture office in the world would employ you for that. You simply cannot communicate with your colleagues. You know, how could you communicate a handmade or you know, manual drawing with a digital drawing done in Revit or I don't know what, you can't. So I really think we are losing our time, uh, you know, uh, I, it's a long discussion and I don't want to start it now, but I really think we are losing our time and the time of the students. I'm talking about the students, teaching them how to work with the T-square and the rectangle for a few years, totally unnecessarily. It's, it's like teaching people to, to, uh, to know uh, Latin in order to go to the grocery in the corner to buy a bread. Well, you go to the grocery and talk in Latin and uh, you will not get the bread. Hello, Mr. Foster. So who is king here, Mr. Foster? Obviously you. Do I see, do we see? Well, there are some people far away here in the, in the presidential balcony, inner balcony, but everybody else, I don't see people chatting there too much in the big office. They are all busy building your, uh, not quite modest buildings. Anyway, but you are an interesting man and certainly a force of the present, that's for sure. I'll be on Riverside, London, London, another building by him, of course, which stands out. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to miss his buildings. They're all perfect and luminous and shining and glittering and uh, making you envious that you are not there, living there. You know, uh, it's just uh, almost irritating, so much success and so much splendor. Uh, anyway. I'm obviously envious. I, uh, instead of doing green architecture, I am sick with green, with a green illness. House in Japan, he built in Japan too. Uh, of course, 
ah, it's not a remarkable house and it could be a museum. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have for me the intimacy of a house, crescent uh, meaning a home, wing, Sainsbury Center, the visual arts, uh, again, large spaces, large techno, uh, whatever, everything is technical, everything is clean, um, air conditioned is air co conditioned air is pumped continuously so people can enjoy themselves there. Uh, yeah, it's a good building, of course, but but again, all that huge space is is able to breathe because of an immense uh, techno uh, pumping of, uh, of uh, uh, you know so called fresh air. Cranfield University Library. I mean, you know, I, here I show only a small part of his works and, and, and he built at least two or three or five times more than I'm able to show here. Um, imagine we had in the world uh, 10 or 20 or 50 offices like Sir Norman Foster has. We would, we would have the world totally filled with splendid buildings that um, so lately they claim they are uh, sustainable, but uh, I don't trust him in this at all. Century Tower, Tokyo, Japan, uh, another, another big building with a big atrium, vertical uh, space where again, you need, you need air conditioning of, of, of the highest order and the highest caliber. The structure, yes, is, is nice, it's interesting, it's in steel, it's, but well, he's building with timber now. In fact, just the other day, I saw a timber building by Sir Norman Foster. He imagines that if he builds with timber, he would have less reasons to be guilty. Well, timber means trees. Trees means uh, uh, cutting down the forest. That's what it is. But, but he smiles, he's confident that humans have uh, unending forests and unending uh, trees and unending resources to continue to build and build and build and build. Caredar, Nîm, France. Well, of course, this is not his building. His building is here. I like more, to be honest with you, but maybe because I'm a sentimental, uh, nostalgic man, I like more the old building because the, the tectonics, the, the, you know, the telluric heaviness of the temple it makes me connect with it more than with the shining uh, glass uh, and steel splendor that uh, Sir Norman Foster built. Here, indeed, there are people who enjoy their lives reading the newspaper, having a juice or a coffee or, or whatever, who said that life is difficult. No, not for the, the users of the buildings by uh, Sir Norman Foster. Although, again, Victor Moldoviano looked exhausted when he was here, exhausted, I think. Uh, I think it's not so easy to work for Sir Norman Foster. I remember in communism, you know, in an institute, the Institute de Projector, my God, you know, there was chatting on the corridors with a coffee, with a cigarette, nobody would say anything, even, even the director of the Institute. I don't think this sort of thing happens in, well, now, and, and no one smokes, of course, because we are health conscious. No architect smokes any longer, no. Um, Maybe that's why they live forever. A glass, glass again. Do you see any open window here? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Then you ask yourself, what kind of air do these people breathe? Well, fine air, but produced artificially. Glass, glass again. This man loves glass. So he's not the only one. Business promotion center. Business, business, and business again. Duisburg, Germany. Glass all the way to the top and uh, perfection of structure and computers waiting for us, for them, for all of us. Uh, and the building uh, is uh, again, uh, the apotheosis of the age of uh, and Anthropocene. <clears throat> we have seen actually, this is almost, I almost said that it's not by him because I made a presentation, but it is by him. And there are many buildings like this in the world. Bilbao, <clears throat> Metro Bilbao, Spain, um, sure, we go up, uh, to the sky and we also go to the center of the earth, underground. A strange architectural animal here. It's okay. You know, we welcome the new. 
uh, even if it's a little bit gray or grayish and uh, metallic. American Air Museum, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Uh, it could have been built by a Japanese uh, architect, maybe Kumihiko Maki or uh, Hiroshi Hara, but no, it's built by F Sir Norman Foster. And we do not have cars inside, but we have planes. Look at them, you know, I was talking about the smallest insect in the world that moves <laughs> by itself without any kind of uh, battery. Well, here we have these giant flying machines, which are totally static if there is no pumped energy. And for that pumped energy, we declare wars to the countries that have it. I hate this building, actually. <laughs> I hate it, you know. I, I mean, what, what, does, what does it tell me, you know? It's a big container that contains planes. Planes are supposed to be in the, in the sky. Now, of course, you have to store them somewhere, but it's something inhuman. I think I'm afraid one day the gods will punish us for all, all these excesses. Look at the big uh, human birds. Maybe we should all have the wisdom of Constantin Brunkush. At, at 60, stop working and play golf for the remaining 20 years if you live like Brunkush. That's what he did. I don't know if there are other artists in the world who did what Brunkush uh, did. He, for last, his last 20 years of his life, he didn't do any art. He just played golf and I don't know, reflected on his, uh, you know, art and successes and strange 20 years plus why would he why would he play golf which is uh, you know uh, the sport of uh, the baron of the thames bank and not faculty of law cambridge well should we call it law or rule because louis Kahn said that man does not make laws god makes them God makes laws. So maybe we should say uh, faculty of rule. Anyway, it doesn't matter uh, the, the word. Uh, what matters here is again, we see huge amounts of glass windows that do not open. And I'm sure with an excellent uh, air within. That came from where? From the basement of the building. <laughs> of course, where diabolical machines pump and pump and pump, Expo Station, Singapore. Now this one uh, is a little special, you know, it's almost uh, science fiction. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's Singapore, the Switzerland of Southeast Asia. They have all the money in the world. Uh, although I have seen a few emigres uh, sleeping under a tree in, in the center of Singapore, it happens. But look at Sir Norman Foster. You know, um, this is not the most modest thing that Prometheus erected on Earth. It's not. It's interesting in a way, but um, is it sustainable? I don't think so. But who cares about sustainability, you know? In the stratosphere of human success, you don't care about such trivial matters. As a design center, um, this is, I think, in an existing building, he transformed it. I kind of like, and again, I like the darkness of the, of the old, uh, but this is maybe my deviant uh, personality that I like, uh, in a way, suffering, perhaps. The ruin, the heavy wall, the, you know, rusted metal and so on. And here we see kind of like this, but I like this more than the shining, luminous, so-called democratic, uh, megalomania of uh, Sir Norman Foster. Electronic elec uh, C is missing perhaps, the Arts European Headquarters. I like electronic art actually, uh, but his building is, uh, you know, it's okay, I guess, sure. Optimistic. The car is inside. What does the car have to do with the uh, electronic art? Uh, anyway. Duisburg housing, Germany. As opposed to Sir Richard Rogers, 
who also build for uh, you know uh, home homeless people and underprivileged people. I don't think I don't know actually. Uh, I don't know of Sir Norman Foster doing uh, something similar. Maybe these apartments are not too expensive, but they are not for homeless people or uh, underprivileged people. Deutsche Bank pal place place not palace, uh, although it could have been called palace. Sydney, Australia. Uh, is it uh, this one? Yes, it is. Is it modest? No, it is not. I think in a shell, I, I, I said everything about Sir Norman Foster. Is it modest? No. It's not modest. But that's probably how he made it on top of the social uh, stair or ladder or how to call it. You know, just like this building. Clark, Clark Center, Stanford, USA, another, uh, we see a certain influence here on a building built in Bucharest recently, I think. I don't like this kind of architecture too much, you know, it's conveniently um, expensive and uh, proclaiming uh, a certain disregard for those who sleep under a tree. But, but I'm sure he doesn't notice them because from the altitude where he is placed, he cannot see those people. City Hall, London. Now this is a burlesque building. <laughs> I have to say, I was surprised when I saw it. I, I, I would not have thought that, uh, that Sir Norman Foster, you know, uh, Baron of uh, Thames Bank would build something like this. Look at this. I probably had some existential crisis then. I know he was very ill at one point uh, and he was in the hospital and he was very grateful to the nurses and doctors who took care of him. Uh, I, uh, maybe he built it uh, when, when he was there at that time. I don't know, but I find it ridiculous. And also considering the function, you know, this is the City Hall of London. How could this be? Well, it is. Now, yes, inside you can take some interesting pictures because he loves this kind of ramps and inner balconies and stairways, escalators. But the building to me is, is contrived and is forced and is um, aesthetically, in my opinion, I hope you agree with me, it's rather ridiculous. And again, glass, glass, and again, glass. Uh, from this angle is a little better, but uh, is this uh, the side uh, view that uh, bothers me somehow? It's why was it done like this? Anyway, but the water is nice, although it's clearly polluted. Uh, the ships are nice, and the building is not. <laughs> it's not. I, I really think this is one of, of his worst uh, buildings. I'm surprised, uh, you know, the big committees in London accepted it, approved it and built it. Because it's nonsensical if this building indeed, let's say he opened up in a way towards the, you know, uh, the river and the sky. Well, he has exactly the same uh, skin, the same uh, materials and the same architectural treatment in the back. It's, 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 I'm sure this part of the building is screaming with envy <laughs> because, because yes, it has the same architectural treatment, but it's, uh, it doesn't have the rhetorics of this side. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't like, if I was a building, if I was this building, I wouldn't like to be here, to be, to, to be this part of the building. I, I would like to be here, but the ridiculousness of the building actually is derived from this side, which is so emphatically, um, you know, uh, look at it. You know, it's like a man with a, an inflated chest. You know, it's really a ridiculous building. I, I don't know why he built it. He can do better. He certainly can do, can do better. But then uh, Rafi, Rafael, Rafael Vignoli, uh, who will end our presentation today, also built a very ridiculous and uh, dangerously ridiculous building in London. We'll talk about Swiss RE headquarters. We all know, we all know this building, of course. Um, 
it had to do with, with Swiss, of course, because we talked about Switzerland when I talked about Singapore. These are the countries of money, right? So the buildings show it glass again and uh, yes 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 it's skillfully done yes it's a tour de force but i will be honest it leaves me cold uh, although i did a pastel drawing many years before sir norman foster of a so-called uh, visionary building which is uh, very similar to this one i can send you that drawing to see i have a picture of it and i did it i think about uh, and now here I am in competition with a with a, with a, with a baron, and of course I have no no there is no chance I can win, but I did that drawing with 15 20 years before he built this building, so no one can accuse me that I uh, I, I I I was inspired by this building by him. Now and it was uh, it, it it was it was part of exhibition, so in fact it's part of the. Uh, the art collection of the First National Bank in Chicago, that drawing that I'm telling you about. Um, I don't know about this building. Yeah. Spirals, but um, it's too sure of itself and it's too, I mean, I'm not really a contextualist in a traditional sense, but look at these poor buildings in front of it, you know, this, uh, Phallic uh, splendor is uh, totally disregarding uh, what's going on here. You know, it's Sir Norman Foster. What can we do? The Baron, an airport in Hong Kong. Airports are uh, the specialty of these people. Sir Richard Rogers built some good ones as well. Uh, Canary Wharf underground station, uh, underground. <laughs> what is underground but above the ground uh, is again him. You know, even for an underground station, Sir Norman Foster cannot get rid of, of himself uh, very easily. McLaren Technology Center, United Kingdom. Some curves, but again, glass, in essence, his architecture is not too complex, you know, but uh, I myself bought L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, which celebrates Sir Norman Foster with many of these buildings like this. So I guess uh, at one point I was myself attracted to an extent. Addition to this art museum in Omaha, USA. Uh, sorry, he built so much that I only have for some works an image and uh, unfortunately not the best, like in this case. Now we know this, the Reichstag dome. I wrote once against this dome and against also the glass pyramid of IMP in Paris, because it's very interesting that um, Paris and Berlin built two steel uh, well, and glass, glass structures, uh, you know, mimicking formerly uh, all the uh, architectures like the dome and the pyramid, but made of glass. And uh, I'm not so sure uh, a pyramid is meant to be transparent and the dome itself also is made to, I understood he, he thought that, uh, you know, he, uh, he couldn't have something heavy, plus this is destined for tourism, but um, I don't know. I, I think this building again, I, I like, I li maybe I like heaviness. I like uh, light lightness in spirit, but not necessarily uh, literally. Otherwise, the structure is, uh, and I had been inside, I visited it, I was on those ramps. You can take very nice pictures with those ramps, it's true. Uh, but uh, I am I, I'm not convinced this is the best architecture that could have been done there. Otherwise, I was told uh, he was commissioned because um, you know, he was a he is a reliable architect, and he knew how to accomplish the work, and he did indeed. He accomplished it. It's a, you know, it's a space of consumption. Uh, I don't know. Should I say the consumption of curiosity, or the curiosity of consumption? It, it is a destination for tourism. You know, here we are on top of the building. So peace triumphed. Right? Forget Ukraine. This is supposed to say to the world, 
the Reichstag with its ominous history is, is different now, it's changed. There is a luminous uh, uh, future for humankind. The, the tourists from all over the world work on those, um, uh, you know, vertiginous uh, ramps and everything is fine on the human uh, paradise, in the human paradise, but, but we know very well what is happening to our neighboring country, right? So uh, it doesn't matter how many glass pyramids we build and how many glass uh, domes we build, uh, the beast in the human being still exists. And um, let's pray that uh, we do not show it too often and uh, it's most uh, savage. Uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, of course, the, the Arab world is very busy now pumping, pumping, pumping oil and building, building, building uh, upwards and upwards and upwards, higher and higher. Why? Because they can, because they have the money, because the oil is there, but that oil will not be forever there. And uh, we keep pumping and pumping and pumping. It's some kind of a craziness, really. Yes, they build some amazing buildings, it's true. Are they expressions of the human, uh, you know, uh, modesty or even wisdom? No, no, they are expressions of uh, maybe despair. This male despair who is growing old and one day will die. So he has to leave behind the tallest building in the world. Look at that. You know, what's, what's that bonanza at the top, you know? What, what is it celebrating? Because this building was not built for God. Let's, let's, let's tell the truth. It's not a building built for God. It's a building built to celebrate the human ego. That's what it is. Kesa Futura, Saint Morris, he is a uh, great uh, lover of expensive places, uh, you know, skiing down the slopes in Switzerland at St. Moritz. St. Moritz, of course, a very expensive uh, destination. I would not even have the, the, the imagination to, to think that one day I would be there, nor do I have the desire. Uh, this man uh, takes his bike, which is probably so light that it's lighter than the, the feather of a bird, and uh, goes to St. Moritz. And uh, in fact, uh, Rem Kolhas, made fun of him, you know, uh, of him and um, Bono, you know, who makes advertisings for expensive uh, bags. And uh, Sir Norman Foster runs on his extremely light uh, bike on the slopes of St. Moritz, or I don't know where. The building is, um, to me, again, rather ridiculous. Yeah, it can be this way or some other way. Uh, I, I, I look at those mountains and I think they smile at us sarcastically. They don't say a word, the mountains, but I think they know better than us. It's a burlesque inflation of a man who has no limits, you know, and who has all the money in the world to build whatever he wants. Uh, a guess, guess has headquarters, of course. Of course, talking about pumping and pumping and pumping. Centrica again, Scotland, glass, glass, no window opens. No window opens and will not open. And the humanoids, the humans are, uh, you know, this is an older picture. You can imagine now those uh, monitors are at least four times larger. At that time, uh, when this picture was taken, they were rather timid and small, nevertheless, People work, work, work. I intentionally read the W as a V, like in German. Uh, Scottish, whatever is there, I don't know. Capital City Academy, London. Uh, I don't know, this must be a picture, or I don't know why those benches had been placed at that interval rather, rather large or long, uh, because it was built before the pandemic. I don't know what's, what's here. It's some kind of a city hall or it's like an academy, a city academy. I don't know. These people look like uh, waiting to be tried. Uh, anyway, I'm beginning to be tired. That's Sir Norman Foster. Wembley Stadium, nothing less. The quintessential stadium of England, a great stadium. And um, here it is. 
They are spectacular, of course, and they work. Everything he does works because if he doesn't, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't be where he is. We, he, we, he, we wouldn't celebrate him. Is it great architecture? I don't know. I, I still prefer uh, what uh, his friend and former partner, Sir Richard Rogers did. The Millennium Bridge in London, But, but we do have to say it that this man, uh, even if he uses a kind of a predictable architectural language, he is uh, doing sometimes interesting works visually, like even this bridge. It's, it's very skillfully done and, uh, you know, pleasing aesthetically and uh, still uh, freshly, you know, so-called uh, modern. It is. I wonder sometimes what would the world, what would the world do without so much steel? Uh, let's imagine there was no steel in the world. And let's imagine there was no glass. My God, my God. We would suffocate, we couldn't build. We wouldn't have architects. We wouldn't have architecture schools, uh, impossible. I mean, even concrete needs some, uh, you know, metal. Uh, there and uh, we'll be lost. Camp now, a stadium. This is a project, I don't think he accomplished it yet. Uh, but look at this image. This is actually a frightening image. Exasperated, uh, no, exacerbated sports, right? We all love uh, sports and especially soccer or football. And look at these people, you know, the frenziness, you know going towards the big stadium designed by uh, Sir Norman Foster. Um, yeah. California State University, rather banal, both outside and inside. Uh, no. uh, Manchester, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, really, I, I, I wish this presentation would land on Sir Norman Foster. I'm tired of him. He's, he's just not doing all the time uh, engaging work. Something in Paris. Well, yes, Descartes was French, but uh, did this building have to be this way? I'm not sure. It's rather banal. Let's, let's, let's say it. It's banal, doesn't matter on, on which side you look. I prefer the trees, especially as they are blooming. It seems it is a spring in this picture, but inside metal, metal, glass, uh, Beijing airport, uh, one of the airports, because we know Zaha Hadid built the most spectacular and the largest, but this is large too. Do we see any human being? No, but who needs human beings? We need airports. You know, look at this airport, you know, it's, it's, um, it's uh, alienatingly large and uh, self-assured and uh, is, is uh, I don't know, I see something apocalyptic here. Maybe I'm in a bad mood, but this interior also is uh, especially deprived of people. But even if there were many people, I would still be a little bit, uh, concerned, you know, uh, so much movement, so many planes, you know, the sky, I, uh, Daniel Lipskin was quoting from uh, uh, Swedenborg, the great Swedish mystic, and, and he said, the more angels in the sky, the more space. But I don't think we can say the same thing about the more planes in the sky, the more space. No, no, I mean, just imagine the machinery needed human and otherwise, to clean up this floor, to make it shining every day like this. Just the floor, Riva Hotel, London. Let's move on. Abu Dhabi. I really, I'm tired of Sir Norman Foster, really. He should play chess on a bench with another retired man and uh, exchange opinions about life instead of covering the earth with all kinds of nonsense because this is really nonsense. We had seen, uh, and, 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 and uh, I'm not showing his latest buildings. This is really Kazakhstan, of course. Why Kazakhstan? Because Kazakhstan can do it. Why? 
again because of the so-called natural resources you know which uh, if you have you know you enjoy uh, the the great chance to invite um, sir norman foster baron of thames bank to build a building for you these are muslims i have seen pictures i don't have here but uh, the the inside has some old furniture the building is like it came down to earth from mars but the furniture is like it, it came uh, down into the building from some flea market i like that very much space portac america new mexico new mexico usa another some kind of an airport no yes it's spaceport uh in uh spaceport what about a time port spaceport uh, these men also of course de designed the headquarters of apple no the famous uh, mega institution in the united states uh, he loves the circle also, you know, it's like the sign of uh, power and centrality, National Arena, Scotland, Glasgow, Apple headquarters, we were talking about it, here it is. This is huge. I mean, I don't know if I'm able to, to convey to you uh, the, 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 the scale of this, uh, of this uh, human perfection, which is frightening. You know, it's frightening because it's so uh, divine in its appearance and pretenses, but 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 it is but there is no becoming here. It's 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 a circle. It's perfect. It's a circle, but there is no becoming. There is no process. There is no open end. It's a closed end. It, it, it frightens me. Look at this. I, I I hope I have here images so you can see so-called normal buildings in the vicinity of this giant thing. This fetish, fetishization of technology frightens me. You know, Steve Jobs, when he was uh, showing up at the great, uh, uh, you know, conventions uh, uh, with a new gadget that he uh, produced at Apple, he had this aura of some, somehow descending from Mount Olympus or from the sky or from uh, the you know the vicinity of God on Earth, and he was showing to uh, the world you know the new iPhone. For God's sake, that smallest insect that I mentioned on the uh, you know not very clean I have to confess floor of my room. Uh, this insect is much more alive than the most sophisticated iPhone that uh, Steve Jobs produced. Because that's, that, that, that iPhone needs charging, and you know very well uh, what happens if you don't charge it. It's dead, dead. The miracle ends. And this building is celebrating what? You think this is uh, some kind of an apparition, some kind of a, you know, a divine creation, you know, is the aura above any saint. It's, uh, I, where is it here? I don't, look, look at this. Look at these are these are so-called regular buildings, and these are not small houses. These are large apartment buildings. Look at this. What is this? What is this? What is it telling me? This building. Now, of course, uh, Sir Norman Foster was just the architect, but the architect envisioned uh, this, um, you know. Uh, uh, mega dreaming uh, that, um, of course, architecture always does that, you know, is in the service of power, name it a king or a corporation. And uh, for the money that the architect receives, the architect uh, builds, uh, if he's skillful, a splendor. This is a splendor, the splendor that Sir Norman Foster built, but it is immense. It is immense. And, uh, and uh, again, uh much more prone to death than that small insect that i uh, i uh, scared away with the uh, with with the sole of my of my foot look look, look, look at it at there you know it, it's i wonder what the extraterrestrial think when they when they look down from uh, from the space on on earth and they see that thing they might be envious i mean look at the highway 
the, this is this is small you know it's it's i mean this is a very wide highway but but the building this building is immense and uh, yeah, look at this it's it's a divine sign on earth you know it's you know all these human insects around they are insignificant insignificant they, this building is proclaiming uh, the divinity of technology and uh, yes steve jobs uh, died but uh, who cares apple continues and it will never stop or so it thinks uh, the queen uh, whatever in jordan another airport sure airports hi highways asphalt concrete steel glass and cars cars the more cars the better it's interesting yes of course it's almost bio it's almost biological or so it appears but in essence it's still based on the exploitation of nature and uh, built on the presumption that the earth is limit limitless in its resources and it is not limitless in its resources sir norman foster sorry now we go to a more modest in a way architect but not excessively modest a japanese a very important architect he got the pritzker prize as well toyo ito a more mysterious architect in a way and let's see what he did to get a pritzker toyo ito he is 81 or 82, while uh, Sir Norman Foster is today 87. Happy birthday to both. So Toyo Ito, born, yeah, he is 81 years old. You see, born in Tokyo. No, he was not born in Tokyo. Sorry, I saw Toyo, but no. I actually, I think he's from uh, Korean uh, parentage. He was, I think, born in, in, in Japan, but his parents were Korean, if my memory is not fa 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 uh, failing me. So born on the same day, today, uh, meaning June 1st, but in 1941 is a Japanese architect known for creating conceptual architecture. I wouldn't really describe it like this, but anyway, in which he seeks to simultaneously express the physical and virtual worlds. He's a leading exponent of architecture that addresses the contemporary notion of a simulated city and has been called one of the world's most innovative and influential architects. Actually, it would be interesting, and I don't think I have here a picture of his office. It's a, it's a cosmic difference between the modesty of his office and the flamboyance, um, the, the controlled flamboyance, generous, democratic as it is, of the office of Sir Norman Foster. In 2013, Ito was awarded the Pritzker Prize, one of the architects, architecture's most prestigious prizes. He was a likely front runner for the Pritzker Prize for the previous 10 years. A recent trend has seen less experienced and well-known winners, for example, Chinese architect Wang Shu in 2012. And the award to Toyo Ito is seen as a recognition of a lifetime's achievement in architecture. He was self-styled, he self-styled, uh, he, he talked about him as a dissatisfied architect. Ah, you see, he was born in Seoul, indeed, in South Korea. Um, I like this, you know, I think we need more dissatisfied architects in the world. I really do. Uh, not that the architects are satisfied, no. I think many of them uh, harbor uh, deep uh, lack of satisfaction, but... Um, in an introspective way, I don't think they actually assume that dissatisfaction, which could lead to meditation, to uh, melancholia even. And I think uh, Toyo Ito knows something about melancholia, maybe after his wife died. Uh, so in 2013, uh, he actually received the Pritzker one year after um, Wang Shu uh, uh, finds inspiration in air, wind and water very nice i wish there are more architects in the world who find inspiration in air wind and water air wind and water uh, maybe we should say it again air wind and water uh, the dwelling for a tokyo nomad woman i actually attended the conference by toyo ito at columbia university in new york many years ago and i wrote after uh, afterwards uh, uh, 
a reaction, an article called Apropos of Toyo Ito's lecture. If you want, I can send it to you, where I was commenting exactly on this work because he presented this work, a dwelling for a Tokyo nomad woman. And it's something said, I think, about, I, but maybe it's the, the traditionalist or the retrograde uh, uh, one in myself. I think it's, uh, if a man is a nomad, is maybe uh, more okay than a woman. Because somehow, at least maybe in my uh, not sufficiently developed uh, uh, mentality, the woman is the repos repository of of, 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 of the home in a way, you know, she, she is the repository of stability. Of, and, and when a woman becomes a nomad, and I have seen a picture, you know, with a woman with a dog and a, a luggage on the highway, uh, it's something sad. When even the woman becomes an exile and becomes, uh, you know, a nomad, who is offering that stability that once she offered? You know, from here to Zaha Hadid, who didn't have a, a, a kitchen in her apartment, luxurious and very spacious apartment in London, is a very short distance. But this dwelling for a Tokyo nomad woman that um, Toyo Ito uh, designed is actually, I think, symptomatic of, uh, in a way, of our restless age. Uh, it's this one, you know, here is in, in, uh, in, a, in, in an exhibition, but, but he, he built it in order to uh, envision it in order to be employed. And here there are pictures of, uh, you know, the nomad woman. I remember, uh, I, I have to read again what I wrote then, you know, how he was commenting that this woman returns at night, you know, from the bar or I don't know where. And he, uh, she returns to this uh, building that he built and, and also the furniture was designed by him as well. But she's lonely, she's alone. And um, I don't know, I, I don't see too much optimism actually in this, you know, although the structure he built is interesting, but um, the, uh, the ideology or the philosophy behind it, um, a dwelling for a nomad woman, a single woman, a nomad, uh, you know, is designed interestingly. Yes, it, it has, uh, you know, uh, everything is uh, sophisticated in terms of aesthetics, but is uh, she's alone, you know, alone. So how happy would she be in this? Uh, you know, yes, interesting environment. And it's interesting also that he designed it for a lonely woman, not for a lonely man, or not even for a lonely uh, uh, couple, if we can say something like this. This is uh, something else, and I don't know why it's here. Sorry, this is a Mediatek that he built and a very well-known building where we will arrive at it. Just look at those columns, which are in a way anti-columns, the reverse of columns. Interesting work. This is also interesting, but but it's almost for me. I, I I had a hard time to think in optimistic terms when I saw him present this work of this uh, house or dwelling for a nomad woman in Tokyo. You know, uh, because this is not something you you put under your arm and you move from here to there. It's, it's still a structure of certain dimensions. So it is, uh, you know, as a, it's meant to be static, but, but her, its inhabitant is not static, it's the nomadic woman. Uh, actually, I'm now curious myself to read what I wrote then. I know I wrote one of my darkest uh, writings exactly about this work. Because as I said, I, I've heard him uh, present this work uh, at Columbia University uh, many years ago. Another, he, interestingly, he was interested in, uh, in, in, in the nomad. Here is a nomad restaurant, also for Tokyo. Maybe he felt himself kind of a, a, a stranger, you know, being born in Seoul. And uh, I, I don't know if he was raised in Korea, South Korea, probably not, but he was born in Seoul and Koreans 
had some troubles with the Japanese, so I, I'm not so sure that they like each other very much, or at least I'm not so sure the Koreans like the Japanese very much. Um, where is it? Uh, and these are projects, early projects by him. Um, tiny houses for nomads again. So kind of interesting. He was, he was at that time preoccupied about uh, smaller structures for nomads, lots of nomads. Uh, he built it, this one, you know, uh, I don't think it's so tiny, but uh, I don't know what to say about it. An early work by Toyo Ito. Now the Tower of Winds, this is interesting and it's, uh, it has some kind of a uh, anti-monumentality mon monumentality because it's, uh, it's uh, transparent and it, 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 uh, it, it modifies its color and uh, the atmosphere around it is, uh, is uh, different depending on the color that it emanates. Uh, it has, it's mysterious, it's ghostly. It's a ghost, it's a ghost, it's an architectural ghost. Uh, is it called the, the Tower of Winds? He loves the wind and uh, yeah, the wind is um, a force we don't think often about, except when uh, when it hits us. But uh, I even thought of uh, launching a competition for, uh, you know, the temple of, or, well, not the word is uh, obsolete, I know, but some kind of a structure, the house of winds, the house of the wind in Chicago, which is the windy city in the United States. Uh, this is the Tower of Winds built by um, uh, uh, Toyo Ito. I don't know exactly what its function is. It might even be a, a, a water tower or something, but uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. It has a, uh, it is something mysterious about it, especially because you don't quite know what its function is. You know, it has something that transcends its function. Uh, its function is not is not obvious. Otherwise, it, it, it plan is an ellipse, is not a circle. Here it is. Toyo Ito, Japan. The Tower of Winds. I like this architecture, which which both serve some kind of a human function but it also has a metaphysical quality and this building does. I think Toyo Ito is a more complex architect than uh, Sir Norman Foster, but that's maybe because, uh, you know, he's, but no, 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 because even in the Orient, there are, you know, very commercial architectural practice and so on. No, it, that's how he is. He's more melancholy. He's more mysterious. I think he's also interested, so to speak, in what we call spirit. And he doesn't look happy, does he? On the other hand, uh, he sports these strange eyeglasses. Uh, architects do have a problem with uh, eyeglasses. You know, a good number of them uh, have uh, bizarre choices of, uh, of the frames of their eyeglasses. These are also, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Did he have to wear such eyeglasses? I'm not sure, but he doesn't look happy. Even if, as you can see in the lower right corner, he received the Pritzker prize. It's incised on his name, Toyo Ito. And the champagne is probably good, but again, he doesn't look happy. And I think, at that time already uh, his wife died. And I think uh, that affected him. I read actually about this, that he, 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 he suffered a lot, that uh, he, lost, he lost his wife. But he still showed up to the, to the celebration. And of course, it's a, you know, uh, it's a big event. Every architect in the world dreams of arriving at uh, such an occasion. Here he even smiles uh, and uh, the member of the Pritzker family is on the right, who offers the medal. And uh, yeah, here he is again, Toyo Ito. And here is a, 
you know, uh, collage of uh, happy architects uh, who, you know, got it. Is there one here that I do not know? Not really. Well, I forgot the name of this one, although I talked about him. But otherwise, you recognize most of them. Uh, Sir Norman Foster is here, and then uh, anyway, strange pair in a way. Kazuyo Sejima and her partner, whose name I will never uh, be able to remember. And this is a problem from, from me. Here is uh, James Sterling, the British architect. Even Ben Turi is here. I, last year I didn't talk about him, but this year I might, although I dislike postmodernism. And uh, the, the, the women's molester, Richard Meyer. And here is Fry Otto. We talked about him the other day. Anyway. Let's move forward. But maybe this picture will inspire some of you willing to arrive at enough reasons to smile and laugh like uh, Sir uh, I am Pei uh, in the lower uh, right corner. This man always laughs. It's kind of like Rafael Vignoli, the Pritzker, the Pritzker, the envy of the world. Now look at this shirt. Now this is oriental aesthetics, you know. I I I I I don't think I would ever entertain the idea to wear such a shirt, but uh, but he does. This is Toyo Ito, and I think we should welcome extravagance. And uh, of course, a gentleman, at least in the European tradition, would not take his shirt out of his pants, but he does. He can be, you know, so-called avant-garde. Uh, it's okay, you know, he's still sporting, uh, uh, you know, a teenage uh, posturing. It's okay. It's okay. But the shirt is uh, as a strange, uh, you know, uh, aesthetics, really. Uh, there it is written boom on that button boom why are why are the why is the double o so fashionable really you know yahoo has double o google has double o zoom has double o uh, boom has double o what, what is it about the double o uh, i know in romania it's something less glorious you know we used to call the toilet the toilet zero zero but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure this is not the case with, I, I don't know, it's, uh, there, there seems to be a fascination, maybe because two letters, two letters O refer maybe to a pair of eyes, or I don't know, like two eyes staring at you, I, I don't know, but indeed, you know, why, why would Google have two, two O's, why would Yahoo have two O's, why would Zoom have two O's, why? At least Zoom means something, but Yahoo and Google don't, as far as I know. Anyway, Serpentine Gallery, 2002, 20 years ago, he built this. And I like this building by Toyo Ito. I do, because he broke the box. Literally, he broke it. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. It's fragmented, it's uh, geometrically agitated as um, the crisis of the box. Uh, he experiments, uh, he experimented, uh, and uh, he, I, I think he's an example in this. You know, he doesn't have a system. And he's built uh, brilliantly, of course, because uh, why? Because they can, the British and the Japanese and the South Koreans now, they, they, they can build anything. After all, the South Koreans built that uh, Prada pavilion by, by Rem Kolhas, where the, the floor becomes the wall and the wall becomes the ceiling, and you rotate the building. Yes, you literally rotate the building, you know, turn it upside down. Sumika pavilion, uh, similar to the serpentine that he built 20 years ago, but this is built in Japan. At that time, he was exploring with this, breaking the box. 
uh, literally, but it's a nice building. And the wooden structure inside is, uh, you know, uh, bringing in some variety. And uh, I, he probably had some kind of a nostalgia for trees. He built a building where the facade was inspired by the tree and uh, it's kind of tree-like, we are going to see it. But here also, you know, it's the, the way he employs the wooden part of the building is uh, he allows for an aleatory uh, uh, movement within the building, which I think is refreshing. So the restrictions of the, the otherwise rectangular building are not so, uh, you know, uh, harsh. And they are not. Also, I think that this uh, horizontal part of the structure is, um, is um, you know, has something almost Gothic about it. You think about the, the Gothic churches in Europe. And, uh, a, and again, it's, it's the fact that, that it's not a, a cerebrally, uh, um, you know, uh, stringent, uh, uh, structure it, 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 it allows for uh, accidental uh, fragmentations for uh, a movement which is which is half irrational i like this you know it's it's disorder he welcomes disorder and i think disorder is a force before order we had chaos maybe we should acknowledge the chaos within our souls and in our minds and express it sometimes at least uh, in, a, in a certain form in architecture. It's a good building, I think, but he employs just like Sir Norman Foster, a lot of glass. At that time, of course, the glass was, uh, and still is, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, demagogically very seductive for us, the humans. Toyo Ito in Japan, a pavilion, it's some, some kind of a bar or coffee shop, or I don't know. He designed also the benches here. I, I hope I have a picture of those benches because they are interesting. But what we, what we see here again is architecture as an adventure. When you create something that is, uh, you know, uh, rather unique and interesting and uh, unseen before, it becomes an adventure, not just for you, the designer, but also for the builder. Now, the builder who, hate, who hates himself would always come and negatively would say, we don't need, uh, you know, adventures. We don't need challenges. But uh, builders who also want to be accomplished human beings and not bored human beings, I think would welcome challenge, challenging buildings and also the engineers. A good engineer would like to be challenged himself or herself. Unfortunately, there are many engineers, like many architects, who do not assume any, or do not want to assume any challenge. So they want just the easy life with the, you know, the. Uh... Anyway, this is the bench uh, I was talking about. And you know, it's not perfectly flat where you see those um, fragmented circles, it's actually uh, depressed a little bit the surface. So it's, it's, it's a sophisticated, it's kind of like his shirt in a way that we, we saw him with uh, some pictures ago. Uh, you see here, you know, and uh, I don't know, what are those depressions in the wood of the bench meant to sit there and not in some other place? It might not be the most comfortable bench in the world, well, I see here these, they sell shoes or something. I'm a little bit confused. I thought it was, or maybe it's a hybrid function. It's possible. Anyway, it's an interesting building. And he has even some, uh, I don't know why I see, I, I thought of uh, the medieval world. I am also see, seeing some, something Islamic a little bit here, but it's in Japanese. And look at the structure, the Echos, Exo system, Exo uh, structure. I, I like it. It's, um, I like anything which is deviant, and this is deviant. I also like, of course, um, you know, uh, some Greek temples uh, which are not deviant, but um, we need, I think, you see, he is employing here uh, the freedom of, of, of more elastic systems 
the spontaneous order I was mentioning a few days ago, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an attempt to bring uh, at least some mechanisms of nature, if I am to use the word mechanisms, into architecture. Sendai Mediatek, we already saw a picture. This is a very important building by him, uh, Mediatek. Um, because mainly the, the a very unusual uh, uh, vertical structure of the building uh, are, are these, uh, you know, where you expect to have columns, he actually has voids, vertical voids surrounded uh, by a constellation of uh, thin uh, poles that uh, are not equidistant. So it's a very, in a way, a very unusual building. Yes, you have the slabs. But instead of the typical columns, you know, solid and so on, here he has a, a look at them. You know, it's uh, the, in a way they are anti columns, you know, and uh, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, whoever the client was and whoever the builder was, the architect was able to, to build in this way. I think it's important to reflect on what structure is, on what a column is, or what, you know, even on the philosophical, even, uh, you know, spiritual meanings of what, what is structure, you know? And uh, here he, I think he welcomes fragility. The building doesn't fall, the building stands, is structurally sound, but it, it gives the feeling, it generates the feeling of a certain fragility. And I think this is a quality. Uh, and uh, yes, it was done uh, expensively, but uh, you know, uh, a good architecture sometimes uh, is not uh, uh, is not uh, very concerned with uh, you know with what the client spends. And if the client is willing to spend, uh, why not? So this is the structure. These uh, these towers. This. Uh, uh, unusual uh, vertical uh, structural elements remind me a little bit of the towers on the on the estate of uh, Ansel Kiefer, the expressionist uh, German painter. Uh, I don't have a picture with them here, but you see, it's like a it's like a questioning of doubting a doubting of the even the legitimacy of it, it, they are doubting columns in a way. They support the slabs, they support the building, but you see they are crooked a little bit. They are almost unsure of themselves a little bit. And again, the true column is actually at the periphery. The center is empty. So very interesting, you know. Um, Toyo Ito. Mediatek with a very clean floor and it has to, it has to be clean uh, every day, which means, uh, you know, an appreciable amount of energy and uh, people probably work on that, uh, on that floor to be so glittering and shining. It's a good work and look at the plan, the playfulness, you know, it's, I, I like this, you know, because I always thought <clears throat> and I continue to think that creativity should welcome play. You cannot create unless you unite work with play. Without play, you cannot create. Uh, this is known even by, uh, by Jean Nouvel who said, I always work like a child who loses himself in his uh, playing. And uh, even Friedrich Nietzsche uh, he said there are three transformations in one's life. He said that first we are camels, you know, we carry on our backs incredible weights, but at one moment the camel says, "Enough is enough. I want power. I want freedom. I want I want to be the king, and or the queen. I I I, I am not going to carry heavy uh, things on my back any longer." So the camel becomes a lion or a lioness transforms itself into the king of the jungle or the queen of the jungle. Now the lion has power. Who else if not the lion or the lioness? But after a while, the lion gets tired of his power or the lioness of, its, of, her power, of its power. 
and becomes unhappy. So Friedrich Nietzsche thought that the lion transforms himself or the lioness transforms itself into a child because the child in his uh, you know, uh, playing rediscovers the world and, and, and discovers creativity through playing. So I think it's very, very important to become from a camel. Well, in a way, it's in this triad, uh, we, we encounter what uh, Brunkush advised us to do. No, uh, uh, work like a slave, meaning be a camel, uh, uh, order like a command, like a king, meaning be a lion and create like a god, meaning be a child. So it's very, very important to be childlike, childlike, not childish, childlike to play. And I think in this building, uh, but not only in this building, uh, Toyo Ito uh, was playing a little bit and good for him. I really like the structure of this. Um, it's luminous, it's playful, it's lighthearted. It's also melancholy a little bit, uh, doubtful a little bit. Uh, it's a special building, I think it is. Again and again, we see the architect as a creator who creates new worlds, who create new things, who doesn't repeat himself, you know? A common architect, a more banal architect would have just created a, you know, a regular grid with a, you know, so-called real columns. But look here, it's in a way, it's the opposite of a so-called real column. But there is so much richness here, you know, in the voidness of the column. Now, this is a building, uh, you know, destined for uh, commerce. Uh, he brings that the trees, I understood this is a famous street, street in, in Tokyo with trees. And we see kind of uh, impressive trees in terms of their height. And some of the tree world is reflected in the aesthetics of the, um, of the elevations of the building. Todd's is, a, you know, is, a, I don't know, some kind of a department store. Uh, he brings complexity into the building, at least in this building. Uh, it brings the so-called disorder of nature into the building. And I think we need that. You know, we need that. We need the, 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 the deviant aspect of the irregularities of nature to be present in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the architectural work. Why should the, the, the structure be just, just be Cartesian? Look here, the, the elevation of the building is saying goodbye to the traditional way of uh, conceiving, uh, you know, the structure for a, you know, a taller building. And it can very well be like this, of course. And I, I see a dialogue between the, the tree, which now doesn't have uh, leaves, uh, uh, but uh, between the tree and the building built by Toyo Ito. Yes, there are reflections or memories of the other two buildings that we saw, the Serpentine Pavilion and the other pavilion uh, he built in Japan. What is this also in Japan? Another tower. This makes me think even more of his uh, white shirt with those uh, pinkish uh, dots um, or surfaces on the... He like, obviously, he likes, uh, you know, uh, the playfulness of... Uh, uh, of um, you know aleatory uh, uh, you know disposition now of uh, aleatory uh, aesthetics and here is shown again and and I think this is important you know I, I look at this building and look at this building is attempting to bring playfulness and thus freedom. To an extent, at least, the building is coherent, is vertical, is cubical in a way, you know, it's uh, even Cartesian, but because how he plays with the windows, he's um, challenging the rigid system. 
to an extent at least. Here is another building. I don't know he built it in Paris or in Barcelona. Uh, one of the two he built other, and we are going to see them in Barcelona. Uh, uh, but now we look at an interesting public theater he built uh, is this one and uh, I like it very much because it is a theater it's a black box but it's not the typical box and uh, again he has uh, uh, the playfulness of placing the um, you know the little uh, I don't know if they are windows or uh, they might be, uh, but uh, again, uh, this uh, accidental uh, irregular placement of these round uh, orifices in the uh, on the surface of the uh, of the theater, I think again uh, they they soften the image and uh, they have a dialogue with uh, with the nature nearby. You know, is is this uh, ability that he has to to soften uh, his buildings are not uh, you know heavy even when they are black, like this one, I imagine it's black or a very dark gray. But uh, they, also because of these curvatures and it's, it's still playful and thus kind of a little bit, a little bit high, lighthearted. Interesting building, interesting theater, Toyo Ito. And it is a theater. I think if you pass by it, you cannot think of it being anything else but a theater. Uh, a museum, he is yes, on an island, this island, uh, there is an Ito museum. I mean, he arrived very far, you know, uh, it's something that Sir Norman Foster is probably jealous of because Sir Norman Foster doesn't have an island filled with buildings by him and even a museum dedicated to him, but Ito does. And these are buildings he built in a way for himself, uh, for this museum. I don't know what he's doing there, but uh, and look at this again, talking about the child playing. Well, you know, uh, we are in that realm, are we not? These Japanese can build anything, you know, and they enjoy themselves, you know, and they have earthquakes and uh, tsunamis and uh, all kinds of uh, terrorizing natural events, and they still are playful, you know, they still enjoy themselves, and they still have the longest longevity in the world. The life expectancy in Japan is the highest in the world. How do you explain? Perhaps because they don't, they don't hang on to their lives. And the gods are uh, are uh, kind with them in a way, you know, because they are they don't care too much. I think if they live or die, and strangely, exactly because of it, perhaps they live the longest lives, the Japanese. And um, yeah, uh, this is also by him, and it's very different from the other building. I, I, I'm not very sure eh, because this is not his island. It's not his property. Maybe this is a piece of land where he was invited to build various buildings and it's called now the, the Toyo Ito Museum. Maybe only one building is per se a Toyo Ito Museum. Um, I don't know. But they're all different and interesting and uh, engaging and I don't know who paid for this. And here we have the you know, the, the you know, uh, visitors of this museum looking at, uh, I don't know what, uh, sitting on those interesting things. Nice, nice. I envy the Japanese, I admire them. In my essay, I talked, I don't know who wrote here himself, I will find out later. I talked about how a human being has two bodies. They are, these are his words, Toyo Ito. One is the physical body. We used to drink water, wake up and so on, perform very primitive actions. The other one is what I call the subconscious body, which is our soul. Who talks about our soul uh, these days? Not too many people, but this man has the courage to do so. Architecture today really needs to stimulate 
and work around two, both bodies. Actually, my architecture is still focused on that. I feel it can never be one or the other body. There needs to be harmony between two, the, the two bodies and how that harmony is reflected in architecture is one of my biggest, is one of my biggest focus. Well, again, he recognizes the duality of the world that you have the mind and you have the body. Uh, you, you have the soul, which is, you know, connected with the, with the, with the, with, with, with the mind and you have the body, the physical world and the psych, psychic world, the psychological world. Both are important, both so-called bodies. And he tried to, to honor both. This is a museum for a mother and a child. Very nice, I think. The idea to have a museum for a mother and a child, the mother and the child, and uh, you'll even see him here inside this museum. All the, the artworks, all the sculptures address this subject, mother and child. Very nice. I mean, the theme of the, su of the subject of the, of the museum, I think is very nice and very needed, I think, in the world, in a, in a world still dominated by males and by their war machines. I wonder if Putin is thinking of his mother or if he's thinking of him as when he was a child or if he's thinking of his daughters. Here he is, Toyo Ito, inside the museum. Probably still said that his wife died. The architect visiting his own work. Very nice picture. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we can learn a lot from the Japanese. Taiwan Solar Stadium can deliver. This is a, a you know, a unexpectedly uh, flamboyant work. He built something like this in Spain, which was, uh, which was, uh, uh, no, no, please, please, please. I, <laughs> uh, please forgive me. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the maliciousness of fate. Uh, anyway. Um, why is this person doing this to me? Toyo Ito. Toyo Ito in Taiwan, I think. Uh, and uh, fireworks, those fireworks that uh, Bernard Chumi said that they are the best architecture. <laughs> yes, that's what Bernard Chumi said, that fireworks are the best architecture. Now look at this structure here, you know, why did he do it in this way? Well, why did God create the, the peacock with that unbelievable um, tail? For the same reason, because, because the, the most beautiful is the most useless in a way. Hotel Portafira in Barcelona, I don't think I will present also Rafael Vignoli uh, today. I'm a little bit tired or I could, but I see people are leaving at one point, there were 17 people, now there are 10. So uh, I understand it has been a long presentation. These are two buildings, uh, hotel built by Toyo Ito in, uh, in uh, Barcelona. Not bad, not bad at all. Uh, interesting. And you see talking, almost talking about the two bodies, the two buildings are different aesthetically. They are two different, well, I cannot use the word system actually. And I also employ color rather courageously and uh, yeah, he, the, the buildings are again, a little bit like that, uh, that shirt he was sporting. Uh, it's a hotel, but uh, it's unusual buildings. And look at the surface of this building is sensuous, is, um, is um, you know, as its movement, it's, it's unpredictability. Uh, it's, it's I, I, I like it, you know, it's, it's different, you know, it's, it, it, yes, it's, it's a world filled with different things, but this is different than the so-called many different things in the world. Um, maybe not so much in the plan, but uh, yeah, a hotel, a hotel by, um, 
Toyo Ito, the Japanese architect born in Seoul, Hotel Portafira, Barcelona, Barcelona, which keeps inviting architects to build interesting things there, although they have their own good architects. Jean Nouvel even tried to challenge uh, Antoni Gaudi with uh, his own garden or conception of a garden. Uh, but that we'll talk about when, we, when his birthday will be. Uh, here is Toyo Ito. <laughs> and uh, Tai Chung, Tai Chung uh, Metropolitan Opera House in, uh, it's in uh, Taiwan. This is a work uh, rather puzzling. Uh, it's uh, again, you know, we are talking here about a sophisticated architect who explores all kinds of things. And um, maybe some of these things that he explored took him by surprise as well. But this is, this is what architecture is supposed to do. Uh, in fact, I think the best buildings are those buildings which take by surprise even the, their author or its author. That's what I would say. If you can make a building which in the end will take you by surprise, you who created it, uh, I think uh, it might be a good building. It's a little bit artificial, artificiously done. It's, 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 uh, uh, it's not really a building that seduces me uh, immediately, but uh, if you see images, these are still images of the building during the construction. The building was not finalized, but we see the playfulness still, the playfulness. And uh, uh, look at the interior. You cannot do this sort of thing with a T-square and a rectangle. I am just sorry, you can't. You can't, it's impossible. Anyway, uh, images from the project, <clears throat> but the building was finalized. I, this is an older presentation uh, from uh, two years ago, but uh, I should have added some pictures. But I like very much the, the adventure of building the building, you know, this tumultuous activity, you know, with many people, many intelligences, many hardworking hands, a lot of technology. This really shows something good about the humans that we can mobilize ourselves to build incredible things creatively. Of course, unfortunately, uh, behind a, lo a lot of this creativity or uh, an after or some kind of an effect of the, all this creativity is a lot of pollution. It's true, but what can we do? Uh, um, we are restless and look at the plan. Look at the plan, but, but it's not so original in a way. Kazuyo Sejima works in kind of in a similar way. Uh, in fact, uh, Toyo Ito has uh, also offsprings, you know, like Su Fujimoto. Uh, there are other Japanese architects like Ishigami who was uh, trained in a way or came from via uh, uh, Kazuyo Sejima. There is something very Japanese about, uh, you know, they, their work, although there are differences between them. Is this ability to unite uh, high technology with playfulness, with almost primeval uh, instincts, uh, the, the primordial, uh, is still present somehow mysteriously in their work, which is still very almost fashionably, fashionably uh, of the present. Uh, the Japanese are very interesting and, and they, are, they are continuously exploring new horizons, new ways of doing things, not just in architecture, in everything. You know, it's, maybe that's why they, they have the longest lives because well, let's not idealize them. They are also capable of waging wars, deadly wars, and also they have also a lot of commercial uh, architecture. Not everybody is Toyo Ito, but they have these exceptions, these exceptional architects who build other, uh, and uh, they build sometimes otherworldly buildings. Interesting, you know? Uh, I really think again and again, we need architecture as an adventure. Otherwise we die of, uh, we, we die of boredom. La Caracola, the snail. Well, unfortunately this building was abandoned, was built in Spain and for some reason was abandoned. Look at it, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. And I think uh, people began to steal uh, pieces of uh, steel from it. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know what that person is doing there. The snail, though, is an architectural snail, and it was uh, is rusted. You can see. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm almost sure some such a scene could not have been uh, seen in Japan, but in in Spain, you know, they build this. Uh, I would say very interesting building, and then they abandoned it. Sad, sad. It's a dead carcass of a building by Toyo Ito, a museum in Mexico dedicated to Baroque art. Well, the building is not so Baroque, or, or uh, to, to my taste, it's a little bit too whitish. I don't think it's one of his best buildings. Um, yeah, the movement of the world has a certain uh, frenetical quality. No, no, it's not frenetical. Uh, a few uh, suggestions of, of, the, of the curvatures of the Baroque, but very timid in a way. And it's too whitish and it's too slick and uh, no. Is not one of his uh, best uh, works. This one is a funeral hall and is, is still white. Uh, it's here. Uh, and the roofing, uh, you know, uh, yes, we suffer when one uh, dies, but uh, the roofing is saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is still maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there might be some reason also to rejoice. Maybe the afterlife is not as bad as we think it is. And um, yeah, who knows? Who knows what he felt? Let's not forget he lost his wife uh, at, at an earlier age. And um, so I'm sure uh, working on such a project had for him a uh, you know, personal, uh, personal meaning. But it's not a morbid building, you know? It, it's uh, it's uh, interesting in a way that he made a you know, the, the building for the performing arts black, and he makes, a, you know, a funeral uh, building or a building serving, uh, you know, the afterlife, uh, a whitish and white and uh, undulated. Why not? Uh, you know, uh, Eros becomes Thanatos and then Thanatos becomes Eros. Toyoito. I think he's a, a, a little bit a more complex architect than, than, uh, than uh, Sir Norman Foster. At least he experiments more. There is more variety somehow. Um, interesting, this picture now where you see the graves and then across the water, you see the building by, the Toy by Toyo Ito. Now the Venice Biennial, I like this Jap the Japan pavilion, pavilion 10 years ago, 2012. This man is thinking also of those people who do not have a lot of means and he builds himself, sometimes even with his own hands and with his steam, very uh, almost ad hoc vernacular architectures. And they're very interesting. And I like this aspect of a socially engaged uh, architecture. Uh, and now, of course, these are just uh, display pieces, uh, models, but uh, they build some of them. And I think, I hope I have some pictures with these preoccupations of this man with a, a white shirt uh, with some strange pinkish, uh, uh, you know, uh, surfaces or dots on, on it. Home for all. I love this. Home for all. We should all have a home. This man was obviously preoccupied from the very beginning about what a house is or a home. You remember the house for a, a nomad, nomad woman. And uh, I like this, these buildings, which are, it's even possible he, he contributed with, with his own money or maybe even paid for by, by himself. I don't know, but he, it's a personal project, building houses which are, which are not serving the rich and famous, which are serving you know, those, uh, you know, so-called common people. And I, I think it's something very beautiful in this engagement of a, of a high-end architect with, uh, you know, such, uh, such preoccupations. Bravo to him. Uh, I think we'll see also a picture. These are, you know, his uh, colleagues, his uh, students, his employees, they work together and they build together, maybe also with some other people, maybe future users of these buildings. Here he is. 
the architect as a social worker, bravo to him. Uh, they still have to cut down trees because what can you do? Uh, well, you could to abstain from building, but that's hard to do for an architect and for humans in general. But I love these young people working together to build something creative. Uh, and uh, here they are laughing, laughing. Uh, here on the right is uh, Su Fujimoto, who worked for Toyo Ito, and he's his most famous uh, offspring, so to speak. Very nice. These people lead creative lives and they have all the reasons to be happy. Now, of course, unhappiness would visit them too. I'm sure they cooked something delicious here. Uh, life. Venice Biennial. They got a prize, I think, a golden lion at the Venice Biennial. Why? Because they deserve it. Because they are playful, because they are childlike, because they are beautiful. They do a socially work relevant, socially relevant work. And uh, we need more of this in the world. Unfortunately, we have to cut, cut down trees in order to build these things. This is unfortunate. I don't know. I don't know very well what to do. Maybe to abstain from building. Here they are again. Uh, where here is Su Fujimoto. Uh, 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 they are with models for some of these buildings. Maybe, no, I don't know if this picture is in Venice. Here he is himself, Toyo Ito, maybe in his office. He has a very modest office considering the success of his practice. Uh, here they are in Venice. Toyo Ito is here and here is Su Fujimoto. I don't know who the other three people are. Bravo to them. And yes, they, they got the, the golden lion. <laughs> Fujimoto is happy and he might get it himself very soon. Toyo Ito, Fujimoto. And again, I regret, I don't know who the other people are, but they received the big, the big honor, the big prize in Venice. I don't know, some of these uh, structures are a little bit burlesque for my taste, but again, it shows playfulness being open-minded, not being stiff. University Library Taipei. Now, I don't know about this work. This work is a, is a clear pastiche, but maybe he did it intentionally. The conception about pastiche is different in Japan than it is, let's say, in Europe or in Romania. You know, sometimes they honor the memory of a past uh, master by copying uh, you know, a certain idea, or in this case, a certain building, this is very similar to a work done by Frank Lloyd Wright or Johnson Wax in Wisconsin, in the United States. It's, it's almost identical. What is different is the fact that uh, he doesn't use a regular grid and there is a, an aleatory movement, but otherwise is, um, you know, the reference to Frank Lloyd Wright's work is obvious. And I'm sure he didn't try to hide it because it would have been impossible to hide it. Uh, yeah, I, they, they have a different conception about, uh, I mean, I, I, I read about it and I hope it is so. Uh, it doesn't quite have that. He's a little bit more playful than, than Frank Lloyd Wright. And I, uh, probably Frank Lloyd Wright would have been outraged or maybe not. Maybe he would have smiled. Maybe he would have laughed. Maybe he would have congratulated Toyo Ito. I don't know. There is a little bit, just a slight touch of, a, you know, a cartoonish, uh, uh, you know, uh, attribute or um, I don't know, characteristic. Here. I don't know how to call it. I mean, these things are a little bit uh, off, in my opinion. You know, but. That's also our, our age, a different age. But the interior, again, check out uh, Johnson Wax in Wisconsin by Frank Lloyd Wright, and you understand immediately because the mushroom uh, uh, columns uh, had been uh, used by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, quite distinctively and brilliant. This is him. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright at the Johnson Wax uh, uh, Center uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin. And this is uh, Toyo Ito. But uh, Johnson Wax built it uh, almost a century earlier. I still like a little more Frank Lloyd Wright, I confess. 
maybe I'm a traditionalist and a conformist. I like a little more uh, Frank Lloyd Wright than, uh, than Toyo Ito, but again, Frank Lloyd Wright. And I was here, I, 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 but it was on a Sunday and I didn't enter the building, although I could have if I knocked at the entrance door, but I was shy. Uh, and uh, I only looked at the interior through the glass door. Again, Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, back to because I, I I I arrived at the end of this presentation. So this is uh, the building by Toyo Ito, and this is the building by Frank Lloyd Wright. And we are not. I'm not going to present to you Kengo Kuman uh, now. In fact, I'm not even going to sh to to talk about uh, Rafael Vignoli. Uh, I will I will end this presentation uh, now. Thank you very much. Pete.